welcome to the Church of the Redeemers Weekly Podcast. We pray that you will enjoy this week's service, and we hope that you will follow us at www.cotrb.org, and may God continue to bless you. This is the day that the Lord has made. The Bible said we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Let us pray. Generous and gracious God, here we are, God, once again, leaning and depending on you. Thank you for this joyful time of celebration and worship, God. Thank you, God, as we look to the hills from which cometh our health and our strength. We thank you, God, because we have identified that we want to be on the right side, which is your side, God. So, God, do what you do best. You said your word won't return to your board. God, I've studied, but I need your indwelling of the spirit. Speak right now to me the only way you can. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Truly to have fun and be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? God still continues to amaze me. He gives us what we stand in the need of, even though we don't know we need it. If you could just rest on your feet this morning for a brief passage of Scripture. I'm coming from the first Corinthians, the 16th chapter. It's only going to be three little verses that I'm going to read in your hearing. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13 is where I'll start. It reads as follows. It says, be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage. Be strong and do everything in love. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Think with me from this thought. Visible signs of our faith. Visible signs of our faith. We've already had Hebrews read into your hearing this morning. And it's amazing how that will connect with what I'm going to share with you today. As Wanda, my wife, and I traveled from Philadelphia to Martha's Vineyard a couple weeks ago, we saw many signs along the way. There were signs which gave us direction on how to get to where we were headed. There were signs that told us places to eat. There were signs that tell you how fast, what the speed limit is that you should abide by. Even when you're crossing in from one state to the next, there are signs that tell you where you are. Therefore, it would be safe to say that signs are devices of communication. Would you agree with that? So the question I pose to myself is, what are the, are the visible signs of our faith, and how would one know? Is it the cross that we wear around our necks? Or the plate in the back seat of our car that says, I'm blessed and highly favored? Or is it the fish symbol on the bumper? Maybe it's because the day is Sunday and I'm all dressed up and we all dressed up. Or is it the marquee on the outside that tells everybody that this is the time that we worship on Sunday? The Bible says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if we do one thing, and that's love one another. And evidently, the visible signs of our faith is seen in how we love. This would mean that there are some action steps that one has to take in order, in order for others to see where we are. See, the nature of and mission of the church suggests a community of people committed to sharing in the celebration of life. 
which would be all-inclusive. In other words, it would be similar to a general store. Because in a general store, it's located in the community, and its function is to sell a wide range of products, not to be com compartmentalized, but to make this one shopping experience, when you go in there, they would have everything that you need. Well, wouldn't a church be the same concept? Shouldn't we be able to come here and find everything that we need? We should be, shouldn't we? In the same way, the church is in a covenant relationship in which the covenant begins with God in Christ to us, where he elects us and summons us to be a part of the covenant with him. And by entering into this covenant, we then enter into a covenant relationship with each other. So if we're in a covenant with God, then we also should be in a covenant with one another. In other words, if we understand the covenant relationship we have with God, then we would understand the covenant relationship or the obligation that we have with one another. As Jesus Christ selected the 12 from among his followers, and he commissioned them for ministry. So the church is also called to reflect Jesus holistically in his word, his deed, and his witness. That's why the scriptures tell us that we live and we die and we are raised and exalted. We live by faith towards the past work of Christ, but we also live by hope towards the future consummation. So in this chapter, Paul is concerned with the everyday life or everyday living of the world and the administration of the church. He opens verse 1 by exhorting the Corinthians to take up a collection for the poor saints in Jerusalem. At the beginning of this chapter, Paul says to the Corinthians, he said, I want you to do just like the Galatian church. He said, I want you to do every first day of the week, he said, lay aside out of your income a portion of that God has blessed you with. That's where we get the 10% from. He said, don't wait till I get there. He said, don't pass the plates today. You already know what your responsibility is. So he says in the beginning of this chapter, we know that we got poor people in Jerusalem. We know that I'm coming, and even though my itinerary may change and I may not be there right now, but he says, find men that you can share that responsibility to and give them the money. And if I need to go with them when they go up to Jerusalem, I'll do that. But the fact of the matter is, he wants us to know, don't wait till somebody gets to your house. It's almost like if you invite me to dinner, right, and you know I'm going to be there at 5 o'clock, don't start cooking at 5 when you see pastor pull up, you know I was coming. Don't tell me where I just got off work, pastor, and I'm sorry, but you knew a week ago that I was going to be coming. Now you want me to stay and wait till you finish cooking. I'm just trying to make it plain. That's the way I see it. So in the ancient world, and this collection for the poor was a way of demonstrating unity of the church. Paul proceeded to tell them that there is a change in his itinerary. He said the change is because there, for him, was a wide door of effective work that had opened to him. And there were many advanced um, there were many people that were pursuing him. So what we have to understand is sometimes we might be in a place that may not be the most safe place, but because we're covered by the blood, he will watch over us. So Paul is telling them that the, uh, 
that there were some challenges that that's why he couldn't be with them at that time. See, despite the present danger, the opportunity to spread the gospel is still available. This reminds me as Christians, there may be times I'm called to, to stand and testify in dangerous circumstances, no matter what those circumstances may be. And the place of greatest risk may also be the place of greatest opportunity. The place of greatest risk also could be the place of the greatest opportunity. These are the visible signs of our faith. So Paul now gives the Corinthian community five imperatives in this text for powerful living or visible signs of our faith. I'm going somewhere. I'm going to help you. So the first one he says, he says, be watchful. See, Christians are to be like strong soldiers on God, watching for their Lord's return. See, where we live is not always a peaceful place. Where we live, there is always concern. Because sometimes we are looking for the bonfire and miss the candle. Sometimes we listen to the shout, but we miss the whisper. See, God will come to you in your worst hour. Watchfulness may be understood as a call for, for the Corinthians to look intensely for the coming of the Lord and conduct themselves in a way that's appropriate to hope. In addition, Paul warns them to, he says, be alert for false teachers in your midst. He says, no one has the right to target individuals for suspicion of crime based on the individual's race or ethnicity, religion or national origin. He said, be alert, church. He said, no one has the right if an African-American man is standing on a corner waiting on a bus to stop and question him regarding where he's going. Paul says, be alert, church. He said, no one has the right to pull over a group of black teenagers because of the kind of car that they're driving. Paul says, we got to be alert. He said, no one has the right to stop a Hispanic driver from going through a white neighborhood because he looks out of place. Paul says, we got to be alert. See, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. This is Eleanor Roosevelt. That's why we have to be alert. Let us not fall asleep as others do, but let us keep awake. Tell somebody to stay woke. Stay woke. Paul is saying that these are imperatives for powerful living. These are the visible signs of our faith. That's for believers. Now, if you don't believe in none of this, then you don't have to worry about none of this. You just keep doing your thing. We'll pray for you. I don't know what kind of results you're going to get, but we'll pray for you. That's what we call to do, right? Pray for you. Something is wrong upstairs with you. That's why we're praying for you. I know you make more money than me, but something is wrong with you upstairs. So be alert. Paul, <laughs> yeah, the elevator had went up. <laughs> so the next imperative Paul says to us, he says, stand firm in the faith. He says, stand firm in the faith. That's right in the text. I didn't add nothing to it. I ain't taking nothing away from it. But I am doing a pericope and over-exaggeration of the text so you'll understand what's in the text. Amen? So Paul says, ground your identity in the gospel by holding fast to the message that Paul has already proclaimed. It is in faith we are to fight the good fight. That's what he says in 1 Timothy, the sixth chapter. In other words, the good fight, more closely considered, it's the contest and struggle which the Christian has to maintain against the world, against the flesh, and against the devil. But the Christian who holds to his faith is like a soldier who does not lead his ranks. Be determined to keep your ranks unbroken, keep close together. The problem we have today is not just with the current president and his administration, but what we are facing is what 
what we are faced with is what I see as a birth defect. See, anytime white supremacy can be identified by our chief commanding officer as having good people in the midst, we have a birth defect. When the sheriff who is found guilty for criminal intent due to hardline police tactics can be pardoned by a president as someone who did nothing wrong, guess what? We have a birth defect. When the president can belittle and mock the late senator and war hero John McCain seven months after his death because he was not a fan of his, we have a birth defect. When a federal judge who is presiding over a class action case can be called out by the president as someone who is incapable of being fair because of his, Mexi Mac Mexican, his, his heritage, his Spanish heritage, we have a birth defect. When a travel ban targeting Muslims can be implemented to keep people from coming into our country, we have a birth defect. See, when the president of the United States can verbally attack four Democratic Congresswomen of color, suggesting that they go back to a broken and crime-infested country, we have a birth defect. So I'm just trying to help you. I'm trying to highlight things that I know that you have read as of late. That's why we have a birth defect. That's why we're in the position that we're in. So in essence, Paul was saying, despite many threats, we are to stand firm in our faith. We serve a God who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we ask or think. So in spite of the birth defects, we still serve a mighty, mighty God. So Paul continues to go on. He says, be men of courage. That's the third imperative. He said, be men of courage. In other words, man is used masculinely, but it does not denounce that women are a part of this particular challenge. For Paul, this means being mature. You see, the mature person has a sense of control. The mature person has a sense of confidence and courage. We must realize as our lifestyles get in line with the kingdom being preached, we become a threat to those in authority who are advocating a different story. The kingdom of God entails a new lifestyle, a new sense of priority, a new community. New wine must be put into new bottles. You know what that means. You can't take old wine, new wine, and put it into the old bottles because it won't hold up. It just won't happen. Therefore, as Jesus sent out his disciples as sheep among the wolves, we are faced with the same opposition today. How do I live this new life in the midst of a world that has established its own views and ideologies of who Jesus really is? How do I develop a sense of priority in my home and in my new community where that where we are allowed, we allow the church to become the instrument and the living epistemal to make the story come to life? Here's what Howard Thurman would say, the great theologian and civil rights leader. He would say, our homes, our institutions, our prisons, our churches are crowded with people who are hounded by day and harrowed by night because of some of the fear that lurks readily to spring into action as soon as one is alone, or as soon as the lights go out, or as soon as one's social defenses are temporarily removed. Remember, you are a soldier fighting against the world, fighting against the flesh, and fighting against the devil. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It says it's profitable for the doctrine for reproof and correction, that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
Also, don't be misled by the masculine language that Paul used. There are many African-American women who have taken over responsibilities that men have left vacant. They have become sole providers for families as well as household managers. They have become CEOs and CFOs of Fortune 500 country, companies like Xerox, which was headed by Ursula Burns, and Sam's Club, which was headed by Rosalind Brewer, and other women of diversity like Indra Noji, former CEO of PepsiCo. Be encouraged, church. This ain't just a man's thing. This is a God thing. And God is going to use everybody and anybody because that's the kind of God he is. He has no respect of person. And he said, if you don't cry out, he said he will speak to the rocks and the rocks will cry out. He said he will use a donkey to speak for him. So don't be misled. Just be encouraged. I'm trying to help you today. This is what the text. The same Reverend Cameron, this is what's in the text. Then he goes on and he says, be strong. He said, be strengthened. Although we cannot strengthen ourselves, we are to submit ourselves to the Lord for him to strengthen us. Now, I don't know, care how much coffee when you wake up in the morning and drink. You say it keep you awake. That's okay. Or if tea is your thing, that's okay too. Or you ain't had nothing to eat because you take medicine, that's okay three. But according to the text, we can't strengthen ourselves. That's why we got to find a place of solitude. That's why we got to have some type of spiritual disciplines in our life. There's a balance for us to be strengthened. I know you're used to watching Popeye on TV and he ate spinach and grew muscles. But the only time you're going to grow any muscles in Christ is you better get in his word. You better walk by faith, not by sight. You better walk worthy in the vocation in which he called you because he called you out of something into something else. And we still want to be like a rubber band, go back and forth. That's why we don't have the strength that we really need. So we can only be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. I'm almost done. But I'm reminded of my own personal story. I was apprehensive about having some surgery that I needed. I had thyroid surgery. And even though my quality of life had diminished, I could not even ride in the back seat of a car without feeling anxiety. My wife was with me. She said, honey, I got the air on. I got the windows rolled down. I said, but honey, I still can't breathe. I found myself for months sleeping in a lazy boy chair in our bedroom with the window up because I was afraid to do the surgery. And so I believe that when the church comes together to share in ministry, the community which surrounds us see us as a united front. See, my faith, which is the substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen, it had to motivate me to give me strength to rely and depend on God to do what he said he would do. I know a lot of us don't like doctors. I don't like them either. But you just get sick. Get sick. If your tooth start bothering you, toothache is the worst pain on earth. I don't care how many Advils or lead, ibuprofen, nuprofen, or whatever you take, you'll find your dentist. And I thank God for that revelation to give us the encouragement to seek out what we need. Therefore, the central belief of what we do and how we go about doing it is the same. 
because we go about expressing significance of it differently in our tradition. I believe God is inviting us to learn that the fellowship we experience with, with each other is a part of God's essential provisions for us. The importance of the community stresses our dependence and willingness to develop a bond with those who are different than we are. That's why we have to love each other. We need each other. Our compassion towards others should mirror Jesus' own suffering on the cross. Hence, this reminds me that the greatness means servitude, and our authority to fellowship is dependent upon brotherly service. Paul says we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good work. So we have to be strong. Finally, he says in this text, he said, let all that you do be done in love. I think I covered all those imperatives, that all you do be done in love. He said, love complements and balances everything else. It keeps our firmness from becoming hardness and our strength from becoming domineering. It keeps our maturity gentle and considerate and our righteousness from becoming self-righteous. Love, like spiritual strength, comes from God. Beloved, let us love one another, for God is love. See, it's easy to say we love God when that love doesn't cost us anything more than a weekly attendance in church. But the real test of our love is how we treat the people right next to us, how we treat the people right in front of us, how we treat our neighbors on our left and our right. See, we cannot truly love God while neglecting to love those who are created in his image. Everyone believes that love is important, but love is usually thought of as a feeling. In reality, love is a choice and an action. God is the source of our love, and we and he loves us so much that he made a choice. That's why he sent his son. I'm really done, but I got to tell you a story. This is a story about a kite. This kite began to talk to itself. This kite kept saying, if I could just get rid of this string. He said, the, the string that's holding me back. The string that's keeping me from going high. The string that's limiting me in where I can go. If I can just get rid of this string. One day, this kite got its wish. The string broke and the kite came crashing down. What the kite did not realize, the same string that can holds it down is the same string that keeps it flying high. So cutting the string didn't free the kite. As Christians, we feel like just like this kite, ready to cut the string of our dependence on God and search for our own personal views. The same string that seems to hold us down is the same string that keeps us flying high. So staying connected to God keeps us from falling. God wants us to trust him and let him hold the string. I just stopped by to tell somebody today that we got to let God hold the strain of hate. Let God hold the strain of love. Let God Hold the strain of loneliness. Let God hold the strain of sickness. If we let go and let God, he will tie a knot at the end of the strain that will keep us connected to him. Somebody needs to hear this today. We're going to let go and let God. Let God be the source of your strength. Let God be the power of your life. Let God take the steps to get to you. Let God walk in the way that you are walking. Let God be the love of everything that you do. Let God be the center of everything that you have. It's not your income. 
It's not your money. It's not your bank account. It's not what you have, but it's your dependence upon him. I'm so glad that I'm still connected to the string of Christ because when he got on Calvary and died, that I can have a right to the tree of life. I was still connected to the strain. So when the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on Calvary, I could feel his blood because I'm a part of everything that he do. These are the visible signs of our faith. We have to be strong. We have to watch. We have to do what God has called us to do. That's why Paul laid these things out. He said, be watchful, stand firm, be strong, do everything in love. But most of all, he said, be mature Christians of Jesus Christ. I'm so glad today that I found the Lord. Oh, he's sweet, I know. He's sweet, I know. Stand on your feet. <laughs>